here today. Nice and warm in here. Can't beat it. We have uh, Sunday School after morning worship, quarterly conference next meeting to review the annual report. Ladies meeting Friday, February 16th. That's at 11 o'clock in the morning. And February is food pantry month. Okay. All right. Great to have everybody here today. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 16. <laughs>
mention um, Barbara Gordnold, which is Barbara Arthur, had congestive heart <coughs> failure this week. And so, uh, having a rough time, we need to keep her in our prayers also. Let's see here. <coughs> yeah, uh, we think she's uh, ice diving down in Baltimore. Oh. Actually, not she, but her grandson and uh, Tommy Jugan, they do this polar bear, they jump in the water. And Audrey's doing that? She's there to watch. <laughs> and I'm sure comment. <clears throat> now, Joyce Albert looks really nice today with that red and black, and her hair looks really nice today. So I'm going to ask her to read the first line. And ladies, if you read with her, and then men, we'll read the italicized lines. Joyce, if you would. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Oh Lord, you know it with me. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was made, you made me secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me. When none of them has yet existed. How we need to be your thoughts, O God. Thank you, may be seated. And let's bow our heads, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it the words we just read from Psalm 139. You say that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We were created in your image and in your likeness. And you have given us the ability to understand things, given us the ability to think and reason and give us the ability to love and to experience gratitude and our Heavenly Father we, uh, we just ought to thank you forever for the great blessing of our very existence no more miracle is needed there's no more sign from heaven that is ever needed that should convince us that there is a great God who is so good that mere existence itself and we are the beneficiaries and we're the blessed ones. And you have given us the ability to commune with you. And that's the greatest thing of all, that a, that a man, a woman, a child, part of creation can commune with the creator in all your glory. And these things have been purchased for us and given to us as a gift in Christ Jesus. And we will thank you forever for that. We're so grateful that we send our loved ones home to be with you. And we don't have to wonder down here if it's, uh, gee, do we have the correct theology? Gee, do we have the, uh, you know, all our things buttoned up right? Do we behave properly? It's a gift of grace and we trust you for salvation. It's not based on us, it's based on you. And therefore we have great hope and assurance and confidence. So speak to us, Lord, that we might come and walk with this great God who has been so good to us. We pray for friends and family. I mean, this prayer list is full of names of people that we love and people we know. There are unspoken prayer requests here that is most important. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that you would put your healing hand upon all these folk, and in particular, our friend that has the unspoken request. We pray that you put your healing hand upon her and that the uh, events might take place to bring her whole and strong and healthy. And so, our Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you and ask you for help, not just for our, that particular individual, but for everyone on in our prayer list. 
and for all the people who are associated with us through family or friends or whatever the case may be. We're so grateful, Lord, for our church down in Anacoke and our friend Joe Roach and his wife and the work they do down there. We ask your blessing upon that fellowship that again they might continue to reach uh, folk that, you know, maybe a more traditional approach wouldn't necessarily reach. But these two love you and they serve you and you have gifted them with your Holy Spirit and they reach out and do a great work. We pray today for Brian and Trish Fink and their work up in Canada. We're so grateful for the long-term faithfulness, their just undying generosity. And we pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and buoy them and uh, help them in their way. We also pray today for Betty Warmoth. We ask you to put your hand upon her and comfort and strengthen her. We pray that you might make through her days in relative comfort. We pray that her breath might come easy and she might feel confident about her health and able to move about without feeling in, in jeopardy. We ask you to watch over those who especially take care of her and we think of all our seniors who are in similar situations. We ask your blessing on them. Lord, we pray for our country, we pray for the world, we pray for our friends in Israel, the nation of Israel. We ask you for, to bring peace there. Father, we ask you to raise up world leaders uh, that will surely stand in the gap and and uh, negotiate these wars down and bring a situation where people can live at peace. Our Heavenly Father, we pray all day. The United States Armed Forces, we think of the uh, law enforcement agents up and down the line, we think of our state troopers who, you know, show up every day. First responders, we're thinking of the fire department, these local Fire Department, specifically the Artesian this week. Lord, we're so grateful for these folk who volunteer and give of their time and their energy and just do heroic work. And we thank you for them. Father, again, we could pray all day. We're, we'll, we'll restrict our public prayers to these. We ask you to hear the things in our heart as we join our voices together and say, Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, of our Lord forever. Amen. <coughs> Folks, before we Open up our Bibles, take a look around the room, and say hi to people you don't already know. Hi, Continue through the Gospel of Matthew, and you have printed in your bulletin Matthew chapter 9, verse 11 through 29, and it is from the, Revi the New Revised Standard Version. And um, I think we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll start. Father, thank you for the stay and the blessings of us. And our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are in full control of the heavens and the earth. You always have been. You spoke these things into being. <clears throat> and before that happened, they were not. There was nothing. But you spoke words. And the universe came into existence. <coughs> Angels, seraphim, cherubim, the spirits of this world came into existence. All things came to be through your word. And you crowned your creation with mankind and made us in your image and in your likeness. And so of all creation, from the beauty of the grass, just the grass is so beautiful 
hammer waves of grain, shrubs and trees and flowers. The heavens declare your glory daily. The skies shout out how good you are. And the stars, the sun and the moon, there's no language on earth that can't understand that there's a great creator. And the magnificent animal kingdom that is just wondrous <coughs> and amazing and entertaining and stunning. And you have made us at the pinnacle of your creation that we might experience fellowship with you in a way that is evidently deeper than anything else <coughs> on the planet. And so our Heavenly Father, we ask you to come and speak to us here today. Words of encouragement, words of strength, words of health, and words of hope. We are in a probationary period down here in this world. There is a curse on this world, and it has brought difficulty, hardship, pain, and suffering amidst the great glory. So our Father called us home to a place where that will all end. And we have access to these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Our passage in the uh, bulletins here today picks up with uh, Matthew. Remember Matthew sitting at tax? <laughs> a hated man, a despised man, a man who the Jews looked at as a traitor, Romans looked at him as uh, a useful, you know, tool. He had a lot of money, evidently. We understand that tax collectors made out pretty well. And that doesn't help either, does it? To see a man who you think has uh, taken advantage of his neighbors, taken advantage of the situations of this world. Oh, he lives high in the hog. Oh, he's got plenty of stuff. Uh, but he's a despised person. And our Savior walked by him and looked at him and said, Come and follow me. We don't know what went on in Matthew's mind. We're not told. We're not told, you know, the process of thinking or if he had been secretly following Jesus and watching and looking and thinking. Probably something like that's the case. But all we're told is just the bald words, come and follow me. And Matthew got up, left everything, followed Jesus. And he left what was a, a life of... Uh, disappointment and hardship and uh, isolation and um, separation <clears throat> to join the disciples of Jesus who would be isolated and disappointed and frustrated and ultimately executed. But now he's doing it for the right reasons and for good things. And he counted it a joy and a blessing, we're sure, to walk with Christ and to be privileged to give his life on behalf of his Savior. Bible. I mean, the whole world knows about the Bible. The whole world understands about the New Testament. And here Matthew leads off with the Gospel of Matthew because of what Jesus did in his life. Took him from nowhere and brought him into the kingdom of God. You realize how great that is? That we're in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of Luke. It's so interesting. Where is the kingdom of God? The word is kind of ambiguous the way Luke says it. Because he has Jesus saying, the kingdom of God, it either says it's among you, or the kingdom of God is within you. It's kind of ambiguous in the Greek. And when I believe when the Bible leaves things that, that are ambiguous, it's for a reason. <clears throat> it's because God wants your mind to fill up with all the possibilities of what could be. And so the kingdom of God, it's in our very midst. Moses said, you don't have to climb a ladder to heaven. You don't have to dig down into the lower parts. But the kingdom of God is among you. And then Jesus said, 
the kingdom of God is within you. We live in a different age in a different place. They couldn't understand the transition that was taking place before their very eyes. That's why when Jesus sat down at the table with tax collectors and sinners, all right? Tax collectors and sinners. Back in the Old Covenant, Moses would go up on the mount and the people of Israel would gather around the base of the mount. And there was a time when there were 70 elders that were called out. 70 elders, not 70 youngers. God didn't say, we, we need some spunky youth. No, he said, let's get some elders. Let's get some gray hair. Let's get some men who have made the mistakes that the younger, energetic, enthusiastic, let's take on the world, kids of men. They were those things one day, but now they're elders and they've been around the block a little bit. Let's get 70 elders together and we'll take the spirit of Moses and put it on them so that leadership can be spread out among the group and not just confined to Moses. And there were strict restrictions, remember? Uh, you can't come near a dead body and get anywhere near anything holy. You would become ceremonially unclean if you had leprosy, okay? Or if a rash developed on your body. You had to go down to the priest and the priest would take a look at it and decide based on what the characteristics of that rash were whether or not you should be quarantined and whether or not you should be isolated from the people because you may be unclean, you may be leprous. And this rash, we're gonna keep an eye on it and we're gonna look at it in a little while and if it's any worse or if it's turned in a certain way, you can't be a part of God's family. You're unclean. The laws <coughs> of holiness, the laws of sacrifice, the laws that would restrict or that would condemn and now Jesus comes along and he sits down with sinners the uncleanest of the unclean and the people look on and they say what kind of a prophet is this what kind of a man of God is this doesn't he understand he's sitting with these people what are people going to say about him what are people going to think about him why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When he heard this, he said, those who have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I want your heart. The prophets would all write and they'd say, who ordered you to come down to the temple and wear out the path to my altar? Who told you to bring these things? Of course, it was God himself. But the problem was, the prophet would say, you're wearing holes in the carpet of my temple. You're wearing up my altar with your tears and with your offerings and with your sacrifices and your words. You say the right things. Your lips say the right things, but your hearts are far from me. That's what Jesus came for to transform the human nature from a lost sinful soul to a holy child of God from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. Mercy is the only way to get there. This whole New Testament is about forgiveness. It's about God looking down at us and not saying, I'm stopping the clock. I'm going to pull out the watch and we're going to wait. When you straighten yourself out, then I'll let you into the kingdom of God, but not until. Because if that was the case, that clock would never start again. <clears throat> because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We don't even realize it. The prophet wrote, David wrote in Psalm 19, Lord, forgive me for the things that I do that I don't even know are wrong. Forgive me for the attitudes that I have that I don't even realize they're really unholy attitudes. They seem right to me. Everybody around me thinks this way. It seems natural, seems normal, seems right. 
But in your light, there's a wholly different examination taking place. I told you before when I used to work at the Foundry and I went to uh, Broome Community College. I've been, at, I've been at three different colleges in my day. Went to Brockport. And you heard the results of Brockport. I had a .76 average. And we thank you. My coach, he, we, I was down at the y, YMCA lifting weights and he said, hey Roop, uh, I've been suspended for academic reasons. How'd you do in school? And he knew. I got suspended. What's your average? And I yelled across the parking lot, 0.76. And my friend said, boy, did he make you look stupid. I said, I don't care. But I did care. And so I went to Broome Community College. That's where Beth graduated from. She wasn't there when I was there. Who knows what would have happened. <laughs> but I, I sort of went to Broome Community College. I actually went to class about three or four times. And when you worked in the foundry, I was a grinder, and uh, the, you'd be grinding all day, and you're supposed to wear a leather vest, a, a leather apron, and I would wear that sometimes, but I wanted to get the foundry experience. So a lot of times I wouldn't wear gloves. Different parts of the day, I wouldn't wear earplugs, okay? Wouldn't wear that leather vest. It's for women and children. And I'd have a rust line where the, where the, the grinding, where, the, where the, the metal filings would spray off the grinding wheel and I'd have a line across my abdomen here that was rust. And I'd go home and I'd scrub my hands. Mom used to get me lava soap, okay? And a scrub brush. And I'd work on those things because there was a lady I was sitting next to in this class and I, I liked her. And uh, I was see, 19 years old and she was 41. And I thought she was great. Well, I'd go there with my clean hands, I'd scrub them up, and they'd get under the. Nothing changes, does it, Diane? <laughs> I'd get under the light, and all of a sudden, those hands that I scrubbed with lava soap and with that brush, I mean, I worked on them. And they were the yellow from the, the metal filings that got into the skin. You just can't get them clean. You know that's the way sin is? It's insidious. It's in us. It gets in our heart. It gets in our soul. It affects our spirit. And there's no love of soap down here in this world. There is no sacrifice, no offering. You could bring all the bulls and goats that ever walked the planet Earth and sacrifice every last one of them. And that blood will never clean one sin. It's all a matter of forgiveness. <coughs> the whole gospel is God coming to this earth and saying, I know that you're infected with this sin. I love you. If you can see that you need me and you want me, I'll bring you into my kingdom Number one, I'll forgive you. But number two, I'll justify you. Okay? We're going to look at the books next week. Okay? I will finish the financial report. Mary Beth gives me the records from the bank. And I will assemble them together. We're going to find out if the beginning balance plus the income minus the expenses. And we're going to have an ending balance. And that beginning balance that we're going to start with, that has to be the same that we ended with last year. And if it doesn't all add up, and Joe Ritter's calling the police. <laughs> we're going to find out where that money went, and we're going to track it down, and Rupert's going to get his, finally. No, I didn't steal a penny. Nobody around here steals a penny. Um, but the book's got to be justified. And a couple of years ago, when we changed hands in the books, I don't know if you remember, but there was like $30,000 missing. And I looked at that and I thought, $30,000? Where is this money? Where could this be? How could we? Is it a mistake? And I didn't know what it was. I thought, well, maybe it's some CDs that we thought we had, but we never really had after all. And I. I thought, all right, it must be just we never really had the money and somehow it's gone. 
It was never there in the first place. Nobody took it, it just wasn't there. And somehow we, we doubled up our CD, our, cat, our, our deposits. And I went to bed that night and I got up in the morning and I thought, that doesn't fly very well at all. That's a lot of money to misplace. Or a lot of money to think you had, but now all of a sudden you're gonna stand before people and tell them you never had it in the first place. And lo and behold, we got a letter in the mail saying, hey, you have money in the Primitive Methodist Investment Foundation. A couple CDs, not in the bank that we do every other business in, but in a different investment foundation. And lo and behold, there is the money. And so I could sleep and stand before this audience and the world and say, our books are justified and they're matched. Will you stand before God and man and every devil and every demon and every angel and every spirit that ever lived and the books in your heart are justified your sins are covered not just forgiven not just well we we're going to give you a pass no jesus died on the cross that your sins will be forgiven he shed his blood to separate you from your guilt i desire mercy that's the way god is i'm telling you i, I I never get tired. I've come to love funerals. Because I tell them the story every time. How Moses went up on the mountain. You know Moses. He's the one God spoke to as a friend. He's the one God said, I speak to my prophets in dreams and visions. But Moses, my servant, I speak to him mouth to mouth. Face to face, I stand on the mountain with Moses. Nobody else can come on the mountain. We cordon off the bottom of it. Get everybody away. Consecrate yourselves, but don't get on that mountain. Moses, come on up. And for 40 days, Moses was on the mountain communing with God. And the Bible says that he met with Moses in the tent of meeting as a man meets with his friend. I'm talking about God the creator of heaven and earth, meeting with another man as a friend. And he says, Moses, I trust in my whole household. I let Moses do whatever he thinks is right because he's faithful and I trust him. And Moses said, Lord, I'm supposed to lead these people to the promised land and you haven't shown me who's going first. I mean, we need an angel we need the host of God. Somehow we need help. Lord, I don't understand. The, the Lord told him, Moses, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll show you my glory. Go up on the mountain. Stand in the cleft of the rock tomorrow. All right? Bring some new tablets. You broke the old ones. You broke the original Ten Commandments. You smashed them on the ground because you saw the people were breaking them. And you might as well be smashed. We'll get a couple stone tablets. Come on up there. We'll do this again. But I'm going to pass before you. We're going to see who I am. And Moses' words, the Lord, the Lord, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, with forgiveness of sins to thousands of generations. That's the God we worship. That's the God I love to tell the world about. That's the God I will spend eternity with. Why? Because he's merciful. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's my spirit. That's my nature. That's who I am. I've come not to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Because if you're righteous, you don't need a crucified Savior. If you're holy, you don't need a crucified Savior. If you told the line, you don't need forgiveness, you need recognition. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, to call the right, not the righteous, but sinners. Somebody said, oh, the church is full of sinners. I wouldn't go there. Hey, man, that's why we're here. Come on in, the water's great. This is the best thing you could ever do. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus and said, hey, you know what? The Pharisees, they fast often. And we do too. 
John the Baptist's disciples. But your, fair, your, your disciples, they don't fast. And Jesus said, you know why? Because the wedding guests can't mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? Guess who that bridegroom is? It's the time. What do you do when somebody gets married, right? Do, do you go up to Montel Country Club and you put charcoal over your eyebrows so you look sad and you all gather together with a long face and you play dollar, dollar music and you're draped in black and it's a sad, sad event, right? At a wedding reception. Or do you go up there and turn up the music and put out a good food feast? And because we're primitive Methodists, you bring out the beer and the, <laughs> the beer and the champagne and everything else, which back in the day we never would have. But we do. I don't. But we do. <coughs> it's time for celebration. It's time for joy. It's a time for happiness because the bridegroom is still here. And Jesus says, you're looking at the bridegroom. This is what it, all that fasting is about. All those prayers, all the fasting, it's about bringing me and this forgiveness and this mercy and this kingdom. Well, the days will come when the bridegroom is going to be taken away from them and then they will fast. See, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. For the patch pulls away from the cloak, and a worse tear is made. You've heard this a thousand times, right? Unsized fabric, you, you, you don't take brand new cloth, and you've got to run it through the washing machine, okay? you got to, what they call, size it. So it shrinks down and, and becomes like the cloth that it's going to be patching on with, so that they shrink and expand at the same rate. And if you don't do that, you just make the tear worse. And wine. You don't put it into old wineskins. Because old wineskins, they become dry. And they become brittle. And they've done their expanding. And you put that new wine in there. And that new wine, when it starts to ferment, and the gases start to come out, and it expands, you've got to have some flexible leather. You've got to have some leather that will give. Or else it bursts and the wine just runs out. Right? But the new wine is put into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. That's one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. We read over it all the time, don't we? You know what he's talking about? He's talking about a day where one time God walked in the garden with man. But then man turned his back on God and said, Gee, the tempter says we could get along better without paying attention to God. We don't have to obey him. And they were expelled from the garden. And now the angel of the Lord would come down and visit with people. We don't really understand what the angel of the Lord was. It Jesus? Was it a messenger from God? Uh, are they angelic beings? Who is the angel of the Lord? He, he's a definitely a representative of God, spoken to as God, but he would come and go. And then God said, my glory will rest in the temple over the mercy seat. And so they built the great tabernacle. And the presence of God rested in a building, in a tent, over the mercy seat, over the Ark of the Covenant. And then God said, I'll send my son. And the very presence of God will be on deck, on display. His name is Jesus. He is God in flesh. He's God walking the planet Earth. Where is God located on Earth? In the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what these people are used to. The presence of God located somewhere on Earth. In Jerusalem. In the presence of Jesus, wherever he happens to be. And then the disciples, when they realized Jesus was going away, they said, they didn't like this. And Jesus said, let me tell you something, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I go away, I'll pour out my Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father, the gift of God, and then the presence of God will dwell in your heart. The kingdom of God is within you. And that's what he's talking about. That's why when John the Baptist, he looked 
from his prison cell and thought, I was sure Jesus was Messiah. I saw the dove rest on him. And John the Baptist told his disciples, go and talk to Jesus and find out, are you really the one or should we wait for another? And then Jesus heard the disciples. They said, are you really the Messiah, really the Christ? And in that hour, he gave sight to the blind. He raised up lame. He loosed dumb tongues. People couldn't speak or hear. He rose people from the dead. And he turned to John the Baptist's disciples and said, you go and tell John what you saw. And as they were going away, Jesus turned to the audience and he said, what do you think of John the Baptist? You think he's some wind, a weed blown in the wind? You know, like one of these flags that flop around and go this way, go that way. <coughs> some sissy, some weakling, some spiritual lightweight. No, Jesus told them, there's none greater on earth. Nobody ever born of a woman, okay? Greater than John the Baptist. But, I tell you this, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. John the Baptist was the end of the era of the presence of God located in a geographical place or in a physical person. But the kingdom of God is God dwelling in your heart with you right now. Helen, you go get John, hitch up the wagon and go up to Buffalo, and shovel out a seat, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit will be there with you. And you come halfway home and stop in Salamanca, New York. You'll find out what it is when you get there. And go to the diner in Salamanca. And then go to a, there used to be a telephone booth in a little town called Friendship, New York. Go in either of those places, that Holy Spirit will still be with you. God is in your heart wherever you go. You have an experience greater than has ever been on the planet Earth. The kingdom of God is here among us. While he was saying these things, suddenly the leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. A leader of the synagogue. My daughter has just died. Would you come and lay your hand on her and she'll live? Well, Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak and said to herself, if only, if I only touch this cloak, I'll be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her and he said, daughter, take heart, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was healed. Why do you suppose these episodes are on the heels of this unshrunken cloth and the new wineskins? We need something newer and better because the actual kingdom of God is here and now in Christ and by the gift of His Spirit in your heart. That's what this is all about. It's about having, I, I love the old Salvation Army. They, uh, the Salvation Army was really an offshoot of Methodism back in the day. And, you know, there's a lot of poverty in old London, and General Booth said, we need to reach out to these people, and, you know, uh, we, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to specialize in feeding and clothing. But they hold services every week, just church services. They called them holiness services. And they were just like a Sunday service, okay? And uh, people would join these uh, posts, and they had a military kind of a setup. With gen there was a general, General Booth, and then there was uh, off army officers. And well, the Salvation Army said, "You know what? We're not going to baptize anybody because we're looking around and we're seeing these people. They think they're saved just because they're baptized, whether they're infants or adults. They think baptism has some power to it, and we're not confusing anybody." We're not baptizing anybody because you need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. 
not by water. That's what changes the heart. It's here. Now, we baptize here, obviously, y'all know that. Okay? And signs and signs and symbols, they have their place. But I love the Spirit. It's you're transformed by the Spirit of God. And you know what else they wouldn't do? They didn't have communion. You didn't come up and eat bread because they said, you know what? We want a closer communion. And just eating bread, people eat the bread, they eat the wine, they think that they're having communion with God. No, communion takes place in the spirit. Communion takes place in the soul. I love the sentiment. That's where the real action is. Everything else is symbolic. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you don't have communion with God in direct prayer, a direct relationship, those other things mean nothing. And in fact, they become condemnatory because they reveal that you don't have something that you're publicly professing to have. No, the kingdom of God is within you. It's a spiritual experience. It's a salvation experience. It's an interchange. Bulls, goats, can't make it happen. Only Jesus can pour that out. And the least in this era of the kingdom is greater than the greatest of the old covenant. <clears throat> well, Jesus came to that leader of the synagogue's house and he saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away, this girl's not dead but sleeping. Jesus, do you really have authority to forgive sins? Jesus, do you really have authority to represent God? Are you really his son? Well, watch and learn. They laughed at him. She's not sleeping, she's dead. This is that crazy prophet we've heard about. Oh, we're going to get a chance to see what they call healing. And we'll see that it's nothing. That he's a fake, he's a phony, he's a fraud. And Jesus said, put him out of the house. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, he went in and he took her by the hand and that dead girl got up. And the report of that spread throughout all the area. And Jesus went from there and two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David, a.k.a. Messiah. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? You really think I'm the son of David? You really think I'm the one sent? And they said, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And then you know what he told them? Don't go telling everybody about this. Keep it quiet. They got John the Baptist. They, they got him in jail. I've got to finish my course. They're going to stir up in time. But don't let it get worse than it has to now. But that man couldn't keep his mouth shut. And I bet the Lord up in heaven smiled and said, who could blame him? The whole world started to learn about Jesus. The one who says, which is harder to do? To raise up a lame man or to forgive sins? And if you can answer that, you can enter the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because, Lord, we're just people down here in this world. We come and go, we do our job, we go to school, we go to work, we do whatever retired people do. I mean, raise our grandchildren, or our great-grandchildren. We've got a lot of things going on down here, Lord. And if you don't reveal yourself to us, we don't know who you are or what you're like. But the good news is that the message from heaven has been received. And the words from the eyewitnesses are mercy, grace. And the apostle John wrote about Jesus himself and he said the law came through Moses, but grace and peace came through Jesus Christ. Speak to us about these things.
And may we thank God for the rest of our lives and for all eternity that we've been privileged to be a part of a church that knows that we need a dynamic, personal relationship with Christ to make any signs mean anything at all. But in Christ Jesus, the whole world means something. Speak to us and we'll thank you forever. Amen. Folks, let's turn in our hymnals to 306. Standing as we stay.